In July 2018, Imran Khan's PTI party dramatically overturned the political status quo in Pakistan and he became its prime minister. But will the former cricketer turned politician be able to keep the ambitious electoral promises he made to win power? Pledges to revive the economy, fight injustice and most challengingly to defeat corruption. Imran Khan has no idea what he's against, he, what he's actually fighting against and what kind of resistance uh, would come. And not just from the politicians, it's going to come from all quarters if he spreads the tentacles of this anti-corruption uh, construct. As that resistance develops, we asked Pakistani journalist Amber Rahim Shamsi to weigh up the successes and failures of Khan's first 100 days in office. For over two decades, Imran Khan, Pakistan's former cricketing hero, has cultivated an image as a lone crusader, fighting against the corrupt, dynastic elites who keep a stranglehold on this country's politics. This is this narrative that he, Imran Khan built about being totally anti-corruption, having zero tolerance for it, and how he uh, sort of actually pointed fingers at both People's Party and PMLN, the two largest parties of Pakistan, as being corrupt and being responsible for all that is happening in here in this country. Nobody thought it's going to take off. The people of Pakistan are so tolerant of corruption as being a part of the political elite that this narrative will never take off. But that narrative did take off. And this year, after a bitterly contested general election, Khan and his Pakistan Tariqe in Saf party finally achieved the power he so desperately craved. Imran Khan promised that the first months of his government would start an irreversible process of change of ending corruption and building a powerful economy, of looking after minority communities and refocusing the country's foreign policy. He pledged, in other words, to create a whole new Pakistan. I'm a Pakistani television journalist and over the last 15 years, I've followed Imran Khan's long journey from the political margins to the top job. Now. I'm curious to see how he'll manage the realities of power. Will he be able to keep his promises? Watching the freshly elected Prime Minister, amid all the pomp and circumstance, and being greeted by the powerful military who have ruled Pakistan for nearly 40 years, it was hard to escape the thought that he'd been handed a poisoned chalice. Not one of his predecessors in the last 70 years since Pakistan came into existence has served out his or her term. Yet Imran Khan was determined to show that he could hit the ground running. He is the first Pakistani politician to announce a 100-day agenda for his new government. आप सबसे मुश्किल फैसले करें जो रिफ्लेक्ट करें कि आपका किबला क्या है आप किस तरफ जा रहे हैं ये बेसिकली डायरेक्शन बता रही है सो 
how is that 100-day plan going? Karachi is Pakistan's largest city, its commercial and financial center, its largest port, and the gateway to the rest of the country. It's a good place to assess the new government's progress and chances of success. I know Imran Khan's supporters would like to give him more time, but the first 100 days have been marked by rising expectations as thousands express their despair and frustrations, the injustices they have suffered for so long, hoping the new government will offer them some comfort and change. From protests about police shootings and college incompetence to calls that something be done about fraudulent builders, this demo has it all. A potpourri of complaints and problems and demands they want Imran Khan to address. Today we are here to show solidarity with Amal Umar's parents. Amal Umar died on 13th of August in a shootout. Um, they were in a car and a police bullet uh, hit her uh, after a mugging. What do you expect from the PTI government because now they are in power? The government, first of all, they have promised, the police has promised that they will change the use of automatic weapons on, on the street. So they, they should not just talk about it in letter, but they must change it uh, physically. We have still not seen that change. Second, we, we hope that uh, Mo, uh, that there is a law that uh, hospitals must provide emergency care. So I hope that law will be implemented uh, implemented in its true sense. We want justice! We want justice! We want justice! We want justice! In opposition, Imran Khan made the elimination of corruption the main focus of his policies. Now, with his 100 days nearly over as Prime Minister, expectations are still riding high. We want justice! We want justice! Demands for justice and an end to corruption have been a recurring theme in this country for many years. But although the new government has moved against its political opponents, like previous administrations who have promised much, it has still to challenge the powerful vested interests that truly dominate Pakistan, despite the clear need for it to do so. Behriya Town, Karachi जो है अब शहर कराची की एक नई पहचान जहां जिंदगी एक नए ढंग में नजर आती है दिस ब्यूटीफुल रेजिडेंशियल सबर्ब वाज बिल्ट रिसेंटली बट बिहाइंड द फसाद इज अ स्टोरी ऑफ इंटिमिडेशन फोर्स्ड इवैक्यूएशंस एंड वायलेंस ये हमारा ये पत्थर लगा हुआ है बर्तानी अंग्रेज ने ये पत्थर का नंबर लगा के हम लोगों को सर्वे जमीन करके दिया था ये वही पत्थर है वही इसका निशान है Nearly 200 villagers were forced out of their homes. Big business groups with links with local politicians and police bought most of them off. Those who resisted soon gave up. Murad Baloch and his elderly father didn't. Why? Why can't we give up our land if we can't give up our land? We have to give up our children from the past few years. We have to give up our children from the past few years. We have to give up our children from the past few years. Who will give up our children from the past few years? Who will give up our children from the past few years? Who will give up our children from the past few years? We don't want to give up our children from the past few years. We don't want to give up our children from the past few years. We don't want to give up our children from the past few years. Murad Baloch is fighting his case through the courts. But the Pakistani judicial system is notoriously slow and skewed to favor the rich and powerful. Cases take months, even years, before a final judgment is made. More to the point, there's no sign yet that Imran Khan's government is doing very much to tackle land mafias or other powerful individuals. Homa Bakai is a professor at Karachi University, a political analyst and an expert in international relations. Pakistan, it is, uh, I mean, I hate to use this word, but they're, they're actually mafias. Uh, uh, the people th thrive on it. And uh, I personally think uh, Imran Khan has no idea what he's against, he, what he's actually fighting against and what kind of resistance uh, would come. 
and not just from the politicians, it's going to come from all quarters if he spreads the tentacles of this anti-corruption uh, construct. In fact, within a few weeks of Khan taking office, the Pakistani media was reporting on the financial wrongdoing of some of his own ministers. Zeb Barki works for one of the country's leading English language newspapers. Some of their party members themselves are uh, facing allegations, have faced allegations previously as well, uh, particularly in the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, previous government in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. So um, one would have wanted them to start cleaning house first and then move on to allegations and, um, you know, what they do. They come on TV and they talk about corruption cases and they keep talking about corruption on the opposition. Uh, so maybe if they sort of went a little more, uh, had a little more introspection and started off from their own party, that would make uh, a difference. Also, I think they will get caught up in this rhetoric eventually in any case, because I mean, it's not as simple. Corruption isn't as simple uh, to get rid of. So how exactly will the government keep its own house in order? It's a question I took to Imran Ismail, one of the co-founders of the PTI party, and now the governor of the Sindh province. We believe in uh, starting accountability from ourselves. The prime minister presented himself first to the authorities saying, you, you can start from me and then go down to others. I'm not saying that all everyone in PTI or, or in this government is an angel. There must be people who, who don't believe in our agenda or, or our program. But, you know, everybody's going to learn the lesson we're not going to spare anyone, be it from the sitting government, be it from opposition, be it from any walk of life. We'll treat everyone the same. Is this just rhetoric? Well, it remains to be seen. But so far, fine words have yet to translate into action. Eliminating corruption wasn't the only major change that Imran Khan promised during the election. He also pledged to turn around Pakistan's ailing economy and create jobs. But within days of coming to power, the new government was forced to face some harsh truths. With an increase in imports and very low exports, the Pakistani rupee has dropped in value, leading to a rise in inflation and price increases across the board. At a local supermarket, I met Shaisa Begum, a widow trying to make ends meet, living on a pension. So what did you expect the first 100 days to be like? Whatever is happening, everything is going up, no doubt about it. But you expect that. We can't really do anything about it. But what I want that eventually it should come down. Oh, so you do want the prices to come down, inflation to come down. Yeah, of course. And that's the expectation. That's it. That's the expectation because inflation is more and the profit is less. Next, I wanted to find out how the price rises and economic crisis were going down with Imran Khan's most devoted supporters. In a Karachi suburb, I found Rafia Sultana. She and her family all voted for the PTI in the last elections. So then, how did you feel? What do you think that your views are full of views? How much? I feel that they are full of views. They have said that I will make a house for people. And they have taken a house and taken a house and taken a house and taken a house. और काफी हद तक काम जो है स्टार्ट हो गया कई शहरों में पंद्रह सोलह शहरों में और फार्म ले लिए लेने शुरू कर दिए उन्होंने और समझे ये बहुत ही मुश्किल काम था बहुत मुश्किल काम था जो उन्होंने स्टार्ट किया बट फॉर द मोमेंट सच एम्बिशियस प्लान रिमेन जस्ट दैट द न्यू गवर्नमेंट हैज नो मनी टू फाइनेंस दम इन द पास्ट इमरान खान है हमने कभी ना अमेरिका ना आईएमएफ किसी से बेकारियों की तरह कर्जे नहीं लेने एड नहीं लेनी। Now in power, Imran Khan has done a U-turn. 
he has gone for an economic bailout from the Saudi government, then from the Chinese, and finally the IMF. This being the 22nd time in 70 years that a Pakistani government has asked the IMF for help. At one of Karachi's leading universities, Kesar Bengali is a dean of economic studies. I wanted to know what he made of the new government's policies. So what you're saying is uh, that the PTI government was not prepared, had not done their homework? That's right, they hadn't. And how is that reflected? Well, the whole confusion about uh, whether to go to IMF or not to go to IMF uh, tells us the government did not, was floundering. Instead, they, they third, they said, we'll go, we'll not go, and even statements like, I'll commit suicide but not go to IMF. Uh, and on the same day, the Prime Minister is making one statement, the Finance Minister is making another statement. They have created this whole uh, mess in terms of perception. And then there was a confusing furore about one of Khan's appointments to a key team of economic advisors. A row that highlighted some of the complex challenges Khan faces in getting his policies through. Atif Mir is a respected economist and academic, known internationally and throughout the Muslim world. Nevertheless, within days of his appointment, there was uproar from religious groups protesting that Atif Mir was from a sect considered to be non-Muslim and therefore he should be dismissed from the government. The PTI initially resisted. Then, a few days later, the government did another U-turn and gave in. It was a political blunder. It was very badly handled. But I don't think he had any choice. And he realized that. And uh, he realized that if he goes the other way and chooses to retain him and sort of digs his heels on it, it would backfire in ways that would be very difficult for him to handle. The main group behind the protests was a relatively new religious party, the Tehrike Labbaik Pakistan or the TLP. Nawaz Huda is one of its leading activists. <laughs> The TLP came into existence a few years ago defending the killer of Governor Salman Tasir. He was shot by his bodyguard because, as governor, he had criticized the death sentence and the jailing of Asya Bibi, a Pakistani Christian on charges of blasphemy. She spent 10 years in jail waiting for the judges to decide whether she was innocent or guilty. On the 30th of October, 70 days after Imran Khan became Prime Minister, the Supreme Court in Islamabad decided Asya Bibi was innocent of all charges brought against her and set her free. A few hours later, the TLP and its supporters came out onto the streets, bringing most cities to a standstill. They called for the three Supreme Court judges to be killed. They declared the army chief to be a non-Muslim and called upon the army to dismiss him. That night, Imran Khan went on television to warn the protesters to give up or face the full might of the state. Aap. اپنی سیاست چمکانے کے لیے اپنے ووٹ بینک کے لیے اس ملک کو نقصان نہ پہنچائیں اگر آپ یہ کریں گے میں آپ کو یہ واضح کر دوں کہ ریاست اپنی ذمہ داری پوری کرے گی 
But the next day, as the protests increased in size, the government did another U-turn. And instead of using force to disperse the protesters, they started negotiations. The leadership of the TLP was not touched. Asia Bibi was not freed. The whole affair underlined some of the most intractable problems the Khan administration faces. How to work effectively within the constraints of an increasingly divided society at home and how to overcome negative stereotypes of Pakistan abroad. Gibran Nasser is one of Pakistan's leading political activists. He is a lawyer and has been fighting for the rights of religious minorities in Pakistan. Even the worst critics of the Pakistan, Tariq Insaf and Imran Khan, came in his support when he addressed the nation and he said that he will not allow anybody to challenge the writ of state while he was addressing the leaders of the tehreek e And from them to then back off and retract and then sign off an agreement where most of the terms are agreed to, for, for right now the nation is not feeling confident. Right now people are disappointed with the government and for that what needs to start is a process where national consensus is built that we together as a nation cannot stand for such activities, cannot stand for such narrative because this is regarding perverting our future generations. This is about hijacking our national identity and our identity as a Muslim and we cannot allow that. Nearly a month later, the TLP leaders were picked up and charged with sedition and treason. The white in the Pakistani flag represents the minorities that live here. Over the years, they've been threatened, many have been killed. Some say the new government has sent the minorities some very mixed signals. The mixed signals also worry Pakistan's neighbours. Both India and Afghanistan claim that attacks on their countries are carried out by groups based in Pakistan. Charges that the Pakistani government denies. The United States has stopped all aid to the Pakistani military in an attempt to put pressure on the new government to change its policy. But it hasn't yet. What it has done is push the new government to become even closer to China, losing the fine balance the previous governments had tried to maintain between the US and China. I think we have to strike a balance not just between China and US, we have to strike a balance across the board. Even within the region, we have to strike a balance between India and China, between uh, India, Iran, other countries. That balance, of course, is, is, is the most logical thing. I don't think there is a question about uh, tilting the balance one way or the other. The balance at the moment is tilted towards China. It has been investing heavily in Pakistan. They are building a major highway from their southwest to the port city of Gavadar. Once up and running, it will reduce the journey time and cost of transporting Chinese goods to the west by half. The China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, or CPEC, could transform the economy of Pakistan and its foreign policy. I think there's a paradigm shift in the thinking of the establishment also. And because we're going towards this corridor politics, connectivity is emerging as a theme for Pakistan. And they, do, they now see it for the political and economic survival of Pakistan. You see, you can't have corridors and they can't just stay empty. Corridors means that they should be functional. So we need connectivity with Afghanistan and we need connectivity with India for this to really happen, to, to really do the turnaround that everybody is looking for. If this happens, it would benefit the Pakistani people and change their lives. It is what Imran Khan has vowed to do time after time for the past 22 years. His message is more radical than any other political leader in the last 40 years. His ascent to power has aroused immense passion in the ordinary people of Pakistan, desperate for a better future. But if the last 100 days are anything to go by, it certainly won't be smooth sailing.